fairly typical. Oh, I thought you were right. This is a fairly typical row of mill houses in Columbus and this particular community associated with Little Swift mills, textile mills. It used to be the whole city was covered with these sorts of houses. Many of them were in much worse condition than these. They would be whitewashed shotgun shacks most often owned by the mill themselves, mill owners themselves, particularly Bibb City, which was an entire community built of, uh, of this sort of housing. When I was a boy growing up here in the 40s and 50s, uh, this was a, a common sight. Uh, now it's very rare. Uh, one of the things that's happened in our city is that the mills, of course, have become automated, and we've had a reduction, a substantial reduction in the workforce here of uh, operatives. Uh, from a high probably of let's say 25 percent of the town's population uh, having been employed in the mills prior to uh, World War I, we're now down to a very small percentage. I don't know the actual percentage now, but around 5 percent maximum, I would think. So there's been significant reduction both in numbers of people who work in the mills and of course uh, in the number of people who live in mill housing. A lot of this housing is now owned by the mill workers, although a great deal of it is simply rental property owned by agencies or, or in some cases I'm sure still the mill, mills themselves. Uh, automation has uh, also affected the mill families and the mill communities in this town. Uh, since there are fewer workers are required to run the machinery and since it has become relatively high tech, uh, quite a few people have left Columbus from mill families, don't live here anymore or have gone into other uh, types of uh, labor and so we have fewer people living in the mill communities themselves and uh, as the people get older uh, we have a geriatric mill community and uh, as the people get older and and die uh, the old traditions here the knowledge of the past uh, is is rapidly disappearing it's a, a bittersweet loss of course the loss of this uh, textile culture one thinks that uh, the people are better off, one hopes, that who got out of here went on to better lives. Uh, still, I, I feel uh, a sense of loss uh, and a sense of identity. Um, I think the people in, in, uh, do too in their own way. And uh, even if they're happy to get out of here and better off in their own lives, uh, I think they look back on this mill experience with, uh, with a mixture of of anger and some regret. Could you talk about the choice of preservation, what they're choosing to preserve? Sure. Uh, uh, and, and be sure to look at us more. Oh, okay. The mill culture is not seen as a culture in this town. Uh, there's no demand uh, among historic preservationists, for example, to preserve a row of mill houses. Uh, they'd much rather preserve the homes of the rich uh, who made their money off the people who lived in these houses. And in fact, that's what's going on in the city. Um, recently, I asked the editor of the paper I worked at um, if I could do a series on the, on the mill people in Columbus, on their culture and their lifestyle and, and so on. And he said to me, uh, those pe I didn't know those people had any culture. Uh, there's not a great consciousness or awareness of, um, of the textile mill worker outside of the, their own immediate community, which is it in itself disintegrating, as you, can, as you will see. Okay. The housing such as you see uh, behind me here is reasonably typical mill housing. 
Uh, it was built for mill workers uh, by the mill owners, uh, really beginning shortly after the Civil War. Uh, there was a boom in Columbus in 1880s and 1890s uh, in the mills, and a great many people uh, from the countryside, uh, poor white farmers, uh, dirt farmers, um, uh, came into town and got jobs in the mills. Frequently the mill housing uh, was better uh, than anything they had known on the farms. And of course they did get a wage, even if their wage was 25 cents or 50 cents a day. And one of the curious things about the South that distinguishes it from the rest of the nation is that we've had many depressions here. Uh, we had a farm depression in 1880. We had terrible farm depressions in 1890. And many of the people who live in these houses today, ancestors, came into Columbus uh, during that time. There was a great deal of violence in the countryside around uh, Columbus during the agrarian movement in the 1880s and 1890s associated with the Farmers Alliance. And uh, a, a lot of farmers uh, abandoned their, their farms as a result of, uh, of both violence and depression, uh, gave up, as they would phrase it, and came to town to go to work for wages. Uh, some of these people's ancestors undoubtedly uh, were among those. I got one thing I need to say about them too, but anyway. Also, <coughs> this might be a good place to talk about the attitude towards the. Okay. Of course, when the boll weevil hit Georgia in 1913, uh, the whole cotton culture changed. Not only the cotton culture in the fields, uh, but also in the towns as well. By 1920, the boll weevil had fairly well decimated the cotton uh, growing uh, culture in Georgia. Uh, many of the people who lived on the farms and raised the cotton gave up and came to town uh, and curiously were found uh, employment in the mills. Of course, the mills were able to import the raw material, bales of cotton from other areas unaffected by uh, the boll weevil. But uh, most of the people who had to raise cotton and who were not in the planter class uh, had to abandon it as a uh, way to make a living and came to town. This included both blacks and whites. Of course, black people were rarely employed in the cotton mills at all until... Oh, okay. As early as 1840s, the mill owners in Columbus made a decision to exclude blacks from employment in the mills. Uh, the argument was in those days, of course, whether to use slave labor uh, in the mills, and they decided against it. Uh, this has had profound effects on this city uh, and on the mill culture here, which is almost exclusively white. Uh, some blacks were hired in very menial labor position as sweepers in the mills or as bale rollers, but uh, only very recently have blacks been employed in the mills as genuine operatives. Um, curiously enough, the first cotton mills in this city were operated by slaves, but they were Indian slaves. Um, just a few miles behind me down the river is the oldest cotton mill in the Chattahoochee River Valley, and it was uh, built in around 1800. Um, Yes. Oh. Mingled with the, uh, the element of overt racism in um, mill employment uh, throughout the, uh, most of their existence uh, has, uh, has been in, in this city, of course, uh, a, a, a class difference. Uh, the operatives in the mill were known by uh, several uh, negative uh, names, uh, Linheads being one. When I was a child growing up here in the 1940s and 50s, um, to be called a linthead, or indeed to be a linthead, uh, excluded you from most of the uh, social life of the rest of the city, to put it mildly. Uh, you were looked down upon. Uh, you felt uh, excluded. Uh, you not only were poor, uh, you were ex excluded in many, in many other ways uh, from society. You were considered ignorant. Um, more than likely, you were uneducated uh, until we had effective child labor and educational laws in this state which were uh, which was much more recent than in most of the rest of the United States 
you likely would get a maximum of 12 weeks education a year. Um, so uh, to be poor and to be white uh, and to work in the mills uh, in Columbus, Georgia uh, for most of their existence has been uh, uh, a heavy load to carry. I got one thing I could say about that, George, I forgot. In fact, the, the differences between people who worked in the mills and those who didn't was institutionalized in this city's educational system. We built here uh, in the early part of this century a vocational high school, one of the first vocational high schools in the South, Jordan Vocational High School. It was then an in, called Industrial High School, I believe, but it was specifically built to teach people to operate uh, mill machinery. And uh, the city, of course, promoted this all over the nation as a um, most progressive uh, a step forward in the uh, education of, uh, of children of the community. But in fact, it was uh, for the mill owners and our benefit. Um, that school is still standing, by the way, uh, and is still associated in the minds of the community uh, though not nearly so much as in the past, with the mill culture in Columbus. To say, for example, that I'm a graduate of Jordan High School in Columbus still is quite a different thing than saying I'm a graduate of Columbus High School. Town and I own everything in it. The building behind me, which didn't look like this when I was a boy, it's been spruced up considerably, was the fundamentalist church of a very interesting character in this city named Parson Jack Johnson who among other things in the 1940s was head of the Ku Klux Klan here. He was an agent for the Talmadge forces in politics in Georgia and he published a weekly newspaper which was distributed primarily to poor whites and mill workers. The newspaper was uh, simultaneously anti-union, anti-black, and anti-legislative reform. Surreptitiously, it was in part financed by the mill owners who bought, who subsidized it both by buying advertising in it uh, and by undercover payments. But of course, the Reverend Johnston received money from numerous sources in the white community. Historically here, the labor union movement in textile industry is associated with integration. And one of the reasons that the labor union movement in Columbus uh, has had so much difficulty over the years is the threat that mill owners would, br would bring in black operatives to take the place of striking workers or for that matter, of workers who protested their working conditions at all. So it has been a two-edged sword here for the mill owners. On the one hand, they could use the threat of bringing in black operatives to suppress any union movements among whites in the mills, and at the same time, they could use this, um, the anti-black feeling among the white people here and the, the uh, prejudice and, and uh, resentment uh, to foment uh, discord between the blacks and the white workers and uh, thus keep control of both. This was a deliberate policy. It was not an accident. The uh, decision to exclude blacks from the textile industry in Columbus uh, was made quite deliberately uh, as early as the 1840s and was a policy followed throughout my childhood in the 1940s and 50s. It's only recently changed. And this building you see behind you here
which as I say was the home of a fundamentalist church here, uh, and also the location uh, of the newspaper, uh, played a great role uh, in that process. During the 1890s and early 1900s, the mill owners worked very deliberately to link unions with outside influence or agitators, as they call them, and even with the socialist and communist movement. You were taught if you were white and you grew up in this community very deliberately that Christian people uh, did not uh, advocate uh, unions. And uh, you were furthermore instructed that uh, to support the labor union movement would, would make you uh, a virtual outcast, which indeed it would in this community. The progressive element in this city, and that's a technical term having to do with the progressive party, and this city's downtown urban population was associated directly with, progressive, with the progressive party, was a very subtle, uh, practice a very subtle manipulation of the politics in regards to this matter. They played the rural element, the farming element, which, from which most of the workers in the textile mills were recruited, off against the in-town urban element uh, of both uh, white skilled workers and also the potential labor pool represented by black workers. Uh, one result of this was that there were almost no black employees in the mills and almost no person would admit openly to being pro-labor, pro-union. Now I don't mean to imply that, uh, that there was no union sympathy here in the city. Uh, there were strikes and, and, and attempts at organization in Columbus going back well before the uh, 1900s. Uh, there was intense labor union activity here and a great many of the workers uh, were involved in the union movement and were uh, both publicly and privately pro-union. To be pro-union publicly though certainly uh, meant that you risked your job at the mill. This was no secret. One of the curious things about Columbus and about the history of the labor union movement here is that for several years, in the early 1900s, we had a socialist newspaper published here called the Herald. Uh, it was a marvelous newspaper by any standards. Uh, Eugene Debs spoke here in Columbus several times at the courthouse, and the, the newspaper was linked to the worldwide uh, socialist movement. and. Uh, was published, I think, uh, finally went out of business around 1907 and 1908. Um, one of the reasons I'm interested in journalism and one of the reasons I do what I do is uh, from my experience of reading this newspaper, which is still today um, uh, one of the best uh, newspapers I've ever read and one of the most courageous. Okay. Columbus was a center of um, AFL activity uh, and was, um, uh, during the 1934 strikes and, and earlier, uh, was um, a center of union activity, not just, uh, in the, not just locally, but also in the surrounding mill towns. You understand that Columbus is part of a, uh, of a chain of, of cotton mill cities that goes as far north here uh, on the river as uh, West Point, Lynette, and, La and, and to some degree LaGrange, um, and uh, that extends to the mills in Opelika to the west, Anniston, and elsewhere. Uh, the uh, labor union movement here in Columbus in the 1830s uh, was a powerful movement uh, that really um, had its roots in the early 1900s uh, when Prince Green uh, who lived here for many years, uh, was head of the uh, International Textile Workers Union. Uh, he was a good friend of Gompers, 
Uh, his name is uh, totally forgotten in this city today, uh, and yet he was part, he was instrumental in uh, labor union organization in this city uh, for many years, both here and in Augusta, uh, and also in New York and elsewhere. All memories, all trace of the labor union movement in Columbus has practically been, from that era, has practically been uh, officially effaced. And you will not find either the, either the strikes of the 30s or the 20s mentioned today uh, in this city, outside of the Union Hall itself. The labor union movement here in the 1930s was a very powerful movement and had its roots really in the early 1900s. For years, Columbus was the home office of the National Textile Workers Union and its president, Prince Green, lived here. From Columbus, he, Green, helped organize labor union movement throughout the South. He was a good friend of Gompers. Uh, he was very active in both the Columbus strikes and in the strikes in Augusta. But uh, as with so many other parts of our history, particularly associated with the unions here in Columbus, in the textile mills, Prince Green's name uh, has almost been forgotten here. Uh, and you won't find him mentioned in any of the city's official histories or uh, in the newspaper. 
wait for it to curl through the oven. Check my check the monitor. I'm gonna open up a bit. Open up, open up, open up, open up, open up. Start roller. Open up. Up. Still looks good. Slowly closing down. Following pretty well. If you get the overcast, it disappeared. Just let it, let it, let it do it. Don't do it. Columbus gets hit by a nuclear strike. All right. Second blast. Okay. Not 90 degrees here. Right. So you're going to have to yeah. Got it. Same. 